Sup peeps, quick disclaimer before I say anything. I am not a doctor and what I am about to say comes from my own personal experience as an individual who has fought hair loss for over a decade. If you are interested in seeking treatment for hair loss, I insist that you do so under the supervision of a doctor. Please do not self-diagnose and do not self-medicate. All right. So with that out of the way, I have talked a lot about finasteride on my channel and for good reason. I think it is the absolute best long-term treatment for fighting hair loss. It's cheap, it's convenient, and has a low risk of side effects, so it's safe. And most importantly, it is very effective since it goes after the underlying cause of hair loss in most individuals, which is follicular sensitivity to androgens on the scalp, something which is determined by genetics. However, just because it is the best treatment on the market doesn't mean it's for everybody. Hair loss can affect people across all ages, ranging from adolescents to seniors. With adults, there is seldom any issue with using finasteride. Finasteride will suppress about 40 to 60 percent of DHT in the body and on the scalp, and for adults, this will rarely result in any adverse side effects. DHT, dehydrotestosterone in adults, is a trash hormone. It has very little activity in the human body outside of the scalp, skin, and prostate, so the only things it does to adults are negative things, such as hair loss and enlarged prostate and acne. Now, a tiny bit of DHT in adults still has some small uses, such as for fertility. It can also help prevent testosterone from aromatizing into estrogen, since excess testosterone will instead convert into DHT, but it's important to remember that finasteride doesn't suppress all DHT. It, again, suppresses only about 40 to 60 60%, which is enough to stop hair loss, but it will still leave enough residual DHT in the body for the small physiological functions it plays in the human organism, of which there are very few. That is why finasteride has been safely prescribed to millions of men since 1992 who have had nothing but positive results from it, and I am among those, indivi among those individuals. I've been using it not since 1992, but for well over 10 years now. Now, when side effects do happen from finasteride, it's not fully understood why, but it could be due to the fact that by preventing the conversion of testosterone into, into DHT, the rise in testosterone could subsequently result in the aromatization of testosterone into estrogen. So that is why it is probably a good idea to get some blood work done before starting finasteride and check your estradiol levels. If they are elevated, that can mean you are sensitive to aromatization, in which case you should talk to your doctor about starting a lower dose of finasteride to mitigate some of the side effects. And also maybe uh, ask your doctor about starting a CIRM, uh, like a Novadex, to lower your estrogen levels. Or you can even ask them about a uh, low dose of an aromatase inhibitor like a Rimidex. But if you're going to choose that option, make sure you get your uh, blood lipids checked as well since it can have a negative effect on cholesterol. Now, uh, even though side effects can rarely occur in adults who use finasteride, there is really no strong evidence of persistent side effects from using finasteride. The few studies done which suggest the existence of persistent side effects were heavily flawed because they had really bad selection bias issues. So what I mean by that is that the participants in the studies already had a negative view of finasteride and were convinced it would cause issues. So it's likely any negative issues they reported were just due to a nocebo effect, which is like the placebo effect, except it's when you convince yourself that something bad will happen, so it does happen. In fact, there's even a study in development on post-finasteride syndrome, which is when people allegedly experience persistent side effects from finasteride, and it's uh, being hyped as a big game changer. I think it's called the Baylor study, and it's going to like apparently change how people perceive finasteride. But here's the funny thing about this upcoming study, is that the people they are recruiting for the Baylor study are people from the Propecia Help Forums, which is a finasteride haters forum, which is full of lawsuit-hungry hypochondriacs. So obviously this study is going to have the very same selection bias issues and flaws as previous studies done on the subject. Now, I know people will point out that in some jurisdictions, post-finasteride syndrome has been medically recognized, like in New Zealand, but the only reason why pharmaceutical companies will do this is for litigation protection. So what that means is that in a civil court, a jury may not care as much about the medical, medical facts of a drug, and they can be persuaded by emotional arguments, such as when doctors are sued for malpractice when there is a bad outcome, even though it's nobody's fault. So by recognizing post-finasteride syndrome as a possible outcome, pharmaceutical companies can protect themselves from such litigation, even when it's grounded in fiction, such as the case with post 
finasteride syndrome. And this is sad that they have to lie like this, but I can understand why they do it. So as wonderful as finasteride is for adults who are trying to fight hair loss or an enlarged prostate and fight against all the horrible things DHT does to the body, there are still a lot of young men out there who are starting to lose their hair and they're worried about whether or not uh, taking D uh, whether or not suppressing DHT, I should say, will impact their physical maturation. Now, this is a legitimate concern because even though DHT, dehydrotestosterone, is a trash hormone in adults, it does play some important roles during uh, pubertal development, such as the development of some primary and secondary sexual characteristics. Fortunately, this is not as big of a deal as a lot of people think, and there are many, many young men in their teens and early 20s who use finasteride, and they have had no issues with it. So looking at physical maturation, physical maturation in men usually peaks by around the ages of 18, I mean, I should say 15 to 17. And being that finasteride has been around for a long time, since 1992, there are many long-term hair loss veterans who actually started finasteride in their late teens. And even today, they have had no issues in the decades they have been using it. Now, there are external factors that can cause early onset puberty or even delay puberty, sometimes dramatically, such as in the case of Jason Blaha, who is 42 years old and still hasn't even had his balls drop yet. Yet. Therefore, people should still always see a doctor to find out if finasteride is appropriate for them since, you know, like I said, there are factors that can change the typical dates of puberty. So what if a doctor determines you are too young to start finasteride? Are you screwed? Do you have to embrace being a slaphead for the rest of your life? Of course not. First of all, you can always get a second opinion from a more qualified doctor, and this doctor may be able to give you a better opinion. So I think it's best to speak with an endocrinologist uh, just to be sure uh, what the uh, consensus is. And if the consensus is you can't use finasteride, you still have other options to save your hair. What you should do if a doctor determines you can't use finasteride because you are too young is to invest in a topical anti-androgen like alpha tradiol or fluoridol. Now, between these two, I find alpha tradiol to be easier to get my hands on, not necessarily better, but just easier to source because it's just more widely available and it's usually cheaper. Now, will this work as well as finasteride? Probably not, but you're not using it as a long-term treatment. You're using it to buy you some time so you can maintain your hair until you are old enough to start finasteride. Additionally, I would consider adding minoxidil as well. Now, normally, I suggest people hold off on minoxidil um, and not use it at all if possible, simply because any gains you get from minoxidil must be maintained with minoxidil, meaning that you can't replace it with anything. So it makes it a little bit of a pain in the ass to have to use it for the rest of your life. But if you're already losing your hair when you're a teenager, the truth is, is that you're probably going to have to use all the help you can get. And it may seem like an arduous endeavor to be on minoxidil for the rest of your life. But let me tell you, as someone who has been using minoxidil for over 10 years, it is the best hair growth stimulant we have on the market. And it works synergistically with finasteride since its mechanism of action is different. So they both benefit each other. And after a few years of minoxidil use, it becomes routine enough to the point where you don't even notice it. It's just kind of like brushing your teeth or combing your hair in the morning. So to give you an example of like how I'll apply it is that I I will sometimes apply it in between the loading screens of video games and when you get really good at it. You can do it in under a minute or even under 30 seconds and you and you don't really have to apply it all over the scalp unless you are maybe a diffuse thinner, which is when you're losing hair all over. Otherwise, you can just get away with uh, applying it to the problem areas and you don't have to apply it more than once per day since its half-life is 23 hours. And contrary to popular uh, belief um, and also what it says on the box and the instruction manuals for minoxidil, you can use it on the hairline and other parts of the scalp, not just the crown. And they only say, uh, the only reason why um, the, the minoxidil instruction manual says it only works on the crown is because that is where it was tested during, uh, during clinical trials when it was undergoing FDA approval. And thus legally, they can only say it works on the crown. But in actuality, it will work anywhere it is applied, even areas outside of the scalp, which leads me to my next point. Will finasteride negatively affect beard growth? Well, one of the secondary sexual characteristics that DHT helps stimulate is facial hair growth. But unlike with the rest of physical maturation, beard development can take a bit of a while. Sometimes men will not have a full beard until they are in their early 20s, in fact. Now, speaking personally, I couldn't give a damn about facial hair. I've never been able to grow a beard. I've never had any desire to grow a beard. And the little facial hair I can grow, I despise having to shave it. So I'd be fine if I never had to grow any more facial hair ever again. I have, in fact, even considered considered electrolysis to remove my facial hair just so I would never have to be burdened with the idea of having to shave my face. So 
That being said, however, I understand that growing a beard is an important thing for some men. I mean, a beard can look good on men, and sometimes growing a beard is even important from a cultural or spiritual standpoint for some guys. So if you can already grow facial hair and you don't have, uh, and you want to start finasteride, I'll tell you right now, you don't have anything to worry about because once the follicle is developed, then suppressing DHT will have no effect on it. And I say this because even transgendered women who have facial hair still need to get electrolysis to remove their beards, and they're suppressing uh, their androgen levels almost completely in addition to using estrogen. So suppressing 40 to 60% of your DHT isn't going to do much to adversely affect beard growth, if anything at all. However, if facial hair is really important and you're an adolescent who you think and you feel you still haven't grown uh, a beard, uh, this may be a caveat against starting finasteride. So a few things you can that, that can be done about this is uh, one, you can try an alternative treatment like a topical antiandrogen as well as minoxidil until you're old enough to the point where you're certain you're not... Uh, uh, you're not going to grow any more additional facial hair. So if you're like 29 years old, you can probably safely rule out any further uh, facial hair growth. And also, number two, what you can do is that you can just accept that you won't be able to grow a good beard and embrace the clean shaven look. Or number three, and this one's inter interesting, you can use minoxidil to help grow your beard. Now for the third choice, this is not an officially recognized treatment and it's based mostly on the anecdotes and experiences of people who have tried it, like you know the channel Alpha Destiny. Uh, that guy, I think his name is Alex, he used it to grow a beard. And there isn't any notable research uh, on the subject, at least no research that I know of, but it does seem that minoxidil in fact works on the beard. And furthermore, it seems that the gains are permanent and this might have something to do with the fact that DHT destroying the follicle isn't an issue when it comes to facial hair since facial hair is DHT resistant and that's why bald people are still able to grow beards. So let's say you're a teenager who wants to save your hair, you're satisfied with the way your beard is, and a doctor has approved you for starting finasteride. When should you start? In my opinion, I believe you should start right away. You may ask, but what if I'm not losing my hair yet? I mean, what's the point of starting finasteride if I haven't even like started receding or losing hair anywhere? Uh, and, you know, I'd answer that by saying that is an even better reason to start finasteride because the closest thing we have to a cure for male pattern baldness is starting finasteride before you even lose hair. You don't want to wait until you've lost ground before beginning treatment under any circumstances. Like when I started treatment, I unfortunately waited too long and I was already in Norwood 3, which isn't that bad. It just means I had a receded hairline pretty much. And by starting treatment, I was able to prevent further loss, but I could not get anything back I lost because these treatments, these pharmaceutical treatments, uh, they're mostly for the prevention of further hair loss rather than regrowth. I mean, a lot of people will get a little bit of regrowth, but they don't actually cause that much regrowth, especially on the hairline where a lot of people are very sensitive to hair loss. So uh, there is no guarantee that you will be able to get anything back that you've lost without surgery. So I did eventually recover lost ground through a hair transplant, but in total, I have spent close to $20,000 on hair transplants, and you don't want to have to spend that kind of money if you don't need to, and you're not going to be able to convince insurance to cover the cost because it is considered a cosmetic issue, not a health is issue, even though I'd argue that maintaining your hair is necessary for good mental and emotional health as well, but good luck convincing a, uh, a an insurance company of that. So even if you're a Norwood 1, which means you have no hair loss, you should still use finasteride unless, of course, you are 100% sure you do not have the male pattern baldness gene. Now, unfortunately, testing the genetic certainty of male pattern baldness is very esoteric, and there is no readily available means of testing this, although you can do genetic testing through websites like 23andMe to uh, see how strongly male pattern baldness runs in your family. But even this does not guarantee whether or not you have the male pattern baldness gene, as it's fully possible to go bald even if you have no family history of male pattern baldness in your family and vice versa. And to just give you an example of that, on my father's side of the family, uh, pretty much everybody is bald except for my uncle. And he had a full head of hair for, for some reason, and I have no, no, no idea why. And the same thing on my mother's side of the family, I think I had one uncle there who had a full head of hair, but everybody else lost their hair when they're in their early 20s. So since baldness will affect over half of men by the age of 50, it's best to assume the worst in that you will have the male pattern baldness gene. And so you can just begin treatment before you lose ground and have to spend thousands of dollars on surgery that may not even give you good results. Because keep in mind that a hair transplant is a medical art and it's possible you may not get uh, results that are satisfactory. And even if you do get good results, it may not be as good as your natural hairline 
fine. You know, I was satisfied with my results for my hair transplant, but I'd still argue that my natural teenager hairline was significantly better, and I wish I'd kept that. So if you're a young guy and you value your hair, which you should unless you want to be invisible to women when you're in college, then you should consider getting on treatment right away. The effectiveness of finasteride is high, the side effect risks are low, and the confidence you get knowing that your hair is being protected every day when you just take a simple pill, that kind of value is just immeasurable. I mean, you have to experience it to know what I'm talking about. So anyways, that's all I wanted to say on that. So get on finasteride as soon as possible, but make sure you just do it right and do it under a doctor's supervision. And thank you for watching. All right, take care.